Thank you very much, colleagues. I think we are ready to uh, begin the next and final session, um, which is the annual general meeting of the organization. Um, I know that Sandra said take a quick break, but as I perhaps just start with the introduction, uh, you will find your way back into this room and we can um, continue. Uh, it's really great to see that there are 99 people in this room at 12.06 on a Friday afternoon. Thank you for being here and welcome. Um, in the last four years, we have tried to use the AGM not only as an important reporting mechanism, as indeed we have to do that, um, but also as a way for uh, members um, which you are now, um, as a result of being delegates at the conference, um, to understand the work of the organization uh, and to find ways and spaces in which you can get involved more actively. Because we do believe that the strength of Paltasa is based on um, its members on the ground, um, you know, in the middle ranks, in the executive management at all different places. And we want to encourage you to see how you can play a part in this. I just want to check if um, I, you can hear me. Can somebody give me an indication? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll continue. I'm going to share my screen now. We can hear you, but I think there was a correction. It's Thursday, not Friday. <laughs> I think you're so used to the general conference finishing on a Friday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Either that or it tells you a lot about um, how tired I am. Um, so here we are. And um, I'm sharing my screen. I just want to quickly go through the uh, agenda for today. I know it sounds very officious, etc. We do have to do this. It's an important part of the business matters of an organization. But we hope to do it in a very um, interesting, creative way so that um, you know, it, it, we take you along. So we're going to start with just introducing the executive team and then some short reports by myself, the deputy chair, the treasurer, and the administrator. Then we'll go into the portfolio. Um, so sorry, Can I just quickly interrupt? We are seeing your um, presenter view, not the main page view at the moment. Um, if you're working with two screens, just swap it on your screens or share the other screen. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thanks, Leandri. Uh, I'm wondering why I don't have two screens. Um, sorry. Let me reshare. Um, <clears throat> Go to slide show. Is that better? <clears throat> Is that better? Okay, no, start the slides so we can see. Mm, no, we are still seeing the, the behind the scenes one, you know, where we see the dis. Um, we have to uh, find your display settings. Um, quickly go to slideshow when you open your PowerPoint. Um, then there will be a, a box to tick. Uh, Presenter view. Uh, tick that so it's off. Do you find it? I'm in slideshow. Uh, quickly share your screen so we can see. Really can't understand what went wrong here. Um, okay, is this better? Uh, we still can't see your screen. Oh. Uh, you reshare you your screen. Okay, let me reshare. Um, okay, reshare. Is that better? Okay, so on the slideshow, um, yeah, quickly say then does a much better. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Sorry about that. 
Right, so I was busy with the agenda. We said we'll talk through the portfolios, then we'll talk to you about uh, partnerships, our strategic partnerships, some ideas about the conference, um, and then any other business. Um, I would like to invite you to please pop into the chat any questions or comments you have as we go along. Now, um, when I took over as chairperson of Hell Tasa in 2017, I did so after Dr. Mandy Schlengwa and her executive team had just finished um, their term of office. Um, and we took over um, a Heltasa executive and an organization that was in good shape, uh, had established really good relationships in the national sector. And so it was an easy kind of handover into the next um, uh, team. Um, but obviously in 2016, 2017, there was a lot happening in the national space that so required that Heltasa also think about how it could be more responsive and more relevant because things around us were changing and we couldn't do things the way that it always had been done. So it was an, inter in, an interesting, but a, 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 quite a challenge in terms of making the shifts, making the changes. One of the greatest shifts that I think um, I've tried to introduce is to change the way uh, meetings, um, the way AGMs, the way reporting happens, because they often happen in ways that silence people. So people get into a very business oriented mode when they come into the meetings and, and it becomes a very officious kind of exchange. We change these meetings to become staff development meetings. So at each meeting of the executive, there's some sort of exercise reflective uh, engagement that helps us to deepen our own practice, but then also address some of the meeting procedure. So as part of my chair re chair's report, I want to quickly, perhaps for members new to Haltasa, um, just talk a little bit about what the organization is, a is about. I want to reiterate that, um, you know, it, it has a long standing in national sector from 2004 and has morphed and shaped in various ways to accommodate new members, different members, different contexts, et cetera. So we are not reinventing the wheel, we're just strengthen, strengthening the wheel, shaping the wheel, and, and maybe uh, influencing the journey in positive ways. Transformation of higher education is key to this organization. And we are thinking mainly about teaching and learning uh, practices how we can build this, how we can increase the professionalization of university teachers, and how we can um, extend the research aspect of writing about teaching and learning, and thereby increasing the kind of robust, theoretical, scholarly part uh, that signals to the world, take us seriously. Teaching and learning is a serious affair. It's not a craft activity that just can be done by anybody because you have a PhD. So we take the business of teaching and learning very seriously in Heltasa, and we've tried to encourage different projects and different um, engagements to this effect. Now, from the 2016 to 2020 moment, we had a set of key objectives that Mandy and her team had, um, had, had uh, identified. My job today is to check after the four year period whether we have delivered on these objectives and whether in fact we have responded. And I, I can say quite confidently that um, yes, we have tried to create an enabling environment for AD practitioners, the conference being a major annual event where uh, people come together as you have seen, despite COVID, we had 300 delegates at this conference um, and thanks again to CUT for being such an enabler themselves in creating the enabling space for the learning that happened in this conference. On strategic objective two, we have indeed strengthened national collaborations beyond the annual conference. We have created opportunities for members to um, get involved in advocacy work. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go on and the rest of the members will do as well. And very important, we have ensured the sustainability of the organizations by developing strategic partnerships. And you will hear from our finance person, Rosaline Savalau, that we are indeed in a very strong financial position as a result of 
the, the efforts we've put in that way. <clears throat> now, we've all heard about the challenges of COVID-19, and indeed from March 2020 till now, it has been a very difficult place for Haltasa as an organization, which is not a university, it does not have the infrastructure of a university, um, for it to still continue to try to be responsive and relevant in the moment. I am very glad that early on in the year, in April, we decided that um, our contribution to understanding and navigating the difficult pivot to online uh, learning, and it was difficult for many of us um, in, in, a, in a substantive way. And one of the ways in which we did that was to then move to online meetings. We've had several of these so that we can, you know, shape and think and talk together. We also issued a call early in the year for what was known as short and sharp and socially aware. Often I think that's such a good description of me. But anyway, these, this call was an uh, invitation to academics to share short public intellectual pieces where they could discuss how they were responding to the pandemic, but how they were doing so with um, embracing and thinking about and, and, and considering students and the uneven playing fields and what we were doing in order to respond to that. So not just the shift to online, but in moving online, were we aware of who we were leaving behind? So that was the main kind of thrust of this project. And it yielded many, many scholarly contributions by various people in the national sector. Wow, and it was so great to see people enthusiastically submitting pieces to be um, um, you know, put up onto the Heltasa website. Um, we do have a document and we'll be publishing soon all these various pieces. Some of the key themes that came up from these pieces, as you can see on the screen, had to do with curriculum, had to do with self-care, had to do with um, collective uh, thinking and responses, inclusivity, etc. Very much like the themes that came up through this conference. So these are definitely strong dominant discourses now that we have seen emerging from a moment of crisis. And the challenge is, how are we going to translate that into practice? We also invited colleagues from the international community to share how they were experiencing the pandemic and what they were seeing as ways of thinking about teaching and learning in different places. So as far afield as New Zealand, Singapore, um, England, America, etc., we got them to write pieces as well. Then we had four very successful webinars. Um, and you see the dates, it ran from April till about June, well attended by hundreds of people uh, in the sector. And our CLCs, with whom you heard from yesterday, were um, mainly involved in leading each of these seminars and doing a fantastic job of engaging using online pedagogy. Now, steering the ship, to use that metaphor, during the lockdown, as I said earlier, has not been easy. We realized we were very thin on the ground. Um, and we appealed to the DHET, should be DHET and not DET, to offer us an extension of the UCDG grant that they had given us. And they very generously um, agreed that we would move this over to the end of 2021. Given the lockdown, we were not able to action some of the projects that we had tabled in the UCDG. Um, myself being the project lead on the Haltasa sustainability project, um, put a motion to the um, executive to consider extending the status quo, i.e. the executive membership, the projects and the financial reporting for an extra year so that we finish the cycle at the end of 2021. This was voted on in the executive team and we decided that um, our chair elect, who is Rita Ganes, 
will continue in her role as chair-elect and I will continue in the role as chair for one more year to make sure that we close the projects fully and responsibly. Uh, you know, that, that is an obligation I feel I have um, before we change leadership again. So that's the plan going forward. And we hope um, that that works out in the interest of public funding and the interest of El Tasa. With that, I would like to hand over to the deputy chair and the chair elect of El Tasa, Ms. Rita Ganes. Thanks, Kasturi. And well, welcome again, everybody. So my role on El Tasa as the deputy chair has been one that was that spread across and um, as this says, there was strategic input, uh, specifically with setting up the structures of the P for the PhD program, uh, with strategic input around conference matters, um, you know, the MOU with regards to that legal and governance matters. Uh, and then there was representation occurring in different spaces. Um, the representation occurred within the special projects, and I'll talk about that later on in this uh, AGM report, uh, as well as the National Coordinating Committee, the NCC, which is the operational structure at a national level to put into operation the framework for announcing academics as university teachers. And then, of course, there were shared collaboration across all the functions within the um, exec, uh, financial oversight with regards to constitution, um, uh, input into membership and the drive towards the way we should be recruiting or how new members should be gained uh, towards newsletters as well as the website. Uh, so there's been, it's been um, a great journey actually. And again, uh, from the deputy chair's point of view, we welcome you to share all your views and to connect with us more as well. Uh, I'm going to move over to Dr. Sebelau, who will give us uh, a report on the financial matters. Thank you very much, uh, Rita and Kasturi for the background that you gave. Colleagues, we, as, as an organization, we always know that we need to account, especially where finances are involved. And this is what I'm going to do. We had a very, we, we have a good uh, financial standing at the moment. We initially started with 529,238. And we really need to thank you because all these funds are from the membership. You'll see that as a membership and conference fees from 2019, we made 264,121 rent. And the investment, because the, there's money that we invest that uh, is about 184. And then because of the membership for 2020, uh, we managed to make about 700, I mean, 77,445 rent and ad hoc workshops that have been uh, conducted were uh, enabled us to raise about 3,600. Now, with regard to the expenditure, we did not spend much this year because of COVID, as uh, Kasturi alluded to. However, there was a website had to keep on running. That is why we managed to keep on communicating with US members. And the, the fees were paid for about 114 rent and 21, 114,000, sorry and 21 rent, and then the bank fee is 1,605. And because there's affiliation to, with ISET, uh, that pay, the membership had to be paid of 1,740. And at the beginning of the year, we traveled once as an executive to have a meeting where I think you saw the picture, that's where we had a meeting as an executive. We, that expenditure amounted to 42,431. And then we have a program that is called a professional professionalization of academic undergraduate academic teaching uh, in abbreviated as PUAT. 
but this program is funded from the EU project. So the, this amount will come back from that project once they pay us back. But we thought it's important that to reflect this. So a general entry will be conducted in order to return this money back. And then we had from 2019, we had a surplus of 223,322 rand. And so what is remaining now, hence we said we have a good uh, financial standing is about 566,000. So colleagues, uh, I just want to thank you all for your contributions and, and trusting us in uh, uh, managing these funds for you. Uh, I would also want to thank our administrator from Rhodes University where our finances are hosted, who is Nomfundo Sigwede. Nomfundo is going to briefly give us the administrative part of the finances. Over to you, Nomfundo. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalyn. Um, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Nomfundo. I work for Rhodes University in Grahamstown. Um, I'm the administrator for HealthASA. Um, this year has been a very tough one as most of the work was done online and from home due to the C-19 regulation. And um, in this time, I had to assist the, exec in the executive members in communicating with the members on ad hoc basis and on different occasion. Um, I also had to do lots of record keeping in terms of setting up Zoom meetings and meeting and in, in, in terms of setting up Zoom meetings for the exec and taking all the minutes held during the year. And then also to keep a track of record of the finances where I assist the treasurer, uh, Dr. Rosalind Sebelao, in terms of um, the UCDP project that is held at um, Rhodes University and also the Heltasa PhD program. Um, despite all the odds, I had also been assisting in communicating with the PhD scholars who are in the program of the Heltasa PhD program by facilitating all the workshops, by, by assisting in facilitating the workshops in this amazing program, which started this year. Um, also, towards the end of this year, I think about two months ago, I had also joined the conference team from CUT as a liaison person between Heltasa Exec and CUT and um, the Poma Grenade, which is our media team to assist with any related needs to conference. Um, by being part of the exec in these trying times, I have learned so much in being able to always think out of the box. And um, yeah, and now I will hand over to the exec member to do their portfolio reporting. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Yes, um, Kasturi has referred to the collaborative learning communities, the CLCs, and those of you who have uh, been with Altasa for some time will know that previously this was called the six, the special interest groups. But because um, to be more uh, relevant, contextually, re uh, contextually relevant, uh, we changed the name to collaborative learning communities. And also to indicate that we are moving away from the silo uh, mentality, but we are working together, taking hands with um, our sister institutions. So here we have three foci, student learning, professional learning, and program development. So if you look at student learning, you will see that we have the first year experience um, CLC, we've got the foundation a CLC, the tutor, mentor, and also the sub supplemental instruction uh, CLC. And then we have a question mark there. So the question mark colleagues is for you to tell us what should be added there? Um, how should things be rephrased so that we can um, continue to be relevant to our context for our lecturers and our students? Then if we look at professional learning, we see that under professional learning, we have professional development, 
Um, and then we have scholarship of teaching and learning, SOTO. And also another question mark, which means that under professional learning, we will definitely have to add more um, CLCs because we need to um, respond to what we've seen is necessary in the conference uh, from the pr presentations we've noticed that there's a lot of stuff, um, a lot of support that is needed. Um, and that is why we ask you to please come forward with ideas about how we can enhance this um, focus. Then when we go to pro a program development, we'll see that the technology enhanced learning, the TAU, um, these are the EdTech people, the tech fundis, uh, they are here in, in that uh, CLC, but then also there is scope for more, and that is why we have that question mark. And then also, this is not reserved for just the fundis, because we've seen in the COVID context that all of us who are even techno um, technologically challenged, and you've seen me struggle a bit in the earlier session, so, so all of us who are struggling and wanting to be there, uh, we can join them and take hands. Then what do we want to do with these CLCs? Colleagues, we want to encourage transformative moments of disruption. We want to foster possibilities to reimagine and recreate as a collective and also purposeful African higher education sector. So wh what are we asking from you? As an, um, the executive uh, members of Hautasa, we're asking for greater, represent greater representation we're asking for collaboration, active engagement, and participation across all of the CLCs. So that is why we encourage you to look at our website, to sign up for one or two CLCs, but also to get involved with as many as you see fit. Thank you, colleagues. Rita? Thanks, Anthea. Um, yeah, moving on from that, we would just talk a little bit about 2020 before we move forward. At first, we thought, you know, what are some of the things that have happened? And of course, one often gets shocked at uh, broadly what you didn't do. But then when you start to think about what you did do, you feel a little bit better. So we've made certain these collaborative shifts happen, as, we, as we've seen um, over the webinars. It was very interesting how the different CLCs came together. Previously, we always worked individually, but the webinars got us working together in different combinations and putting out some um, valuable information, but more so gaining a lot of new interest uh, from the wider community, uh, from the community within the African region as well. And so we were very pleased about that. There were also, um, SASA pieces written by uh, the CLCs, which was great and which was increasing in the scholarly work as well of the CLCs. And in terms of the website, yes, currently the website is not where it should be in terms of the CLC information, but it will be there uh, possibly by the beginning of January 2021. Um, everything seems to be working uh, towards that. And then again, we are very proud and we apologize for the incorrect naming of the CLC. It should have been the uh, Tutor Mentor SI CLC. But again, as we mentioned previously, we are really proud of that publication. Uh, it's the first for us, but certainly not the last. And so we invite more people to come on board, uh, you know, and to use the platform of Altasa to move towards these publications as well in a more collaborative manner. And so how do we see ourselves going forward then? Uh, I think one of the most important things for us will be from uh, moving from reactive to a more reflective and proactive um, space uh, in the sector. Uh, we, we need to capitalize on what's been happening on all these virtual platforms. Uh, there's been such wonderful engagement throughout, not only this conference, but throughout the webinars. And we'd really like to carry this forward into all other events that we possibly plan or possibly collaborate with you and what you have in mind uh, for us to be able to hold, host or work with. And then, and, and I think that speaks to that, uh, the points about input suggestions using the platforms. And I think more especially, you know, a lot came out over the three days on networking, but also being courageous and brave to take those first steps. The networking can only happen if we start to be courageous enough to take the first steps 
uh, and we start to work um, you know, towards all by all of us. And so, yes, we're never going to get everything right, but certainly together, we're going to get many things going forward. Um, and then we move to, and I think somebody even mentioned it in the chat, uh, how do we increase, um, you know, uh, not just at a national level or very siloed level, how do we take membership forward and use the platform uh, in a better manner? And what we're looking at is, uh, you know, a strong collaboration with our Southern African partners, but also uh, having a lot more to be done at the regional levels. We've identified about eight regions. We couldn't go provincial. It makes things, the geography makes things difficult. And so we looked at uh, better possibilities to go regional, and uh, then we moved to institutional as well. Uh, there needs to be conversations starting at institutional levels, and you are the champs to be able to do that. Take some of these things and start those institutional conversations. Um, and then uh, the next thing is, as we are encouraging completely an increase in the scholarly work. And so we invite you as well to share whenever you have, uh, you know, you may have published an article, but you may want to turn it into a little piece uh, for the community. Uh, by all means, you can use the Altasa space uh, for you to do that. Any thought pieces, we welcome all of those interactions. Uh, from a scholarly point of view, you don't even have to belong to a particular CLC to do that. You are welcome to come in and share that, and possibly you'll be encouraged to join a CLC. Um, and with that, I'm going to move to Dr. Williams uh, for constitutional matters. Good, thank you so much, Rita. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandra Williams. I'm at Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and I'm going to speak to um, the constitution and the development thereof. Two days ago, I was reminded that many moons ago, when Altasa was first known as SAD, um, I attended at the time, and at the time, the, there was just a statement of intent. And over the years, as Altasa, uh, when the uh, organization became Altasa, uh, we've developed and now we're looking at a constitution. The constitution is the founding um, instrument of this organization and it spells out the purpose, objectives, who the stakeholders are and how we function. And it's a legally binding document. However, at the same time, we also need to be reminded that the constitution informs the governance of the organization. And for good governance, it is necessary that we review the constitution regularly because it needs to ensure that the objectives are current, activities are current, our operations, and that the, it reflects the recent changes so that it can continue to be a workable and sufficiently flexible to meet our um, needs. So therefore, as Altasa grows, as it develops, as it evolves and expands, it is necessary for us as an organization to review the constitution. And that review has happened over the year. That review is ongoing and it is still happening. And just on a side note, as far as the South African constitution is concerned, since its adoption in 1996, our constitution was amended 13 times. And it is purely because of the fact that our constitution has to reflect um, the needs of the organization, the needs of a country, so that as an organization, we can effectively carry forward our mandate and the, the strategic tra trajectory in this changing educational landscape. At this moment, we are also um, considering the status of Altasa as an entity. And one of the options that we're looking at is that the um, institution should the organization sorry should be a, a non-profit organization we are looking at the legal implications they are and how we can carry out this resolution furthermore we, it's also very important that we develop corresponding rules and guidelines that speak to the objectives of the um, constitution in the light of the fact that we're constantly reviewing the constitution on the 29th of September, <clears throat> excuse me, the executive passed a resolution to amend the constitution. And this um, was well thought through in the light of, <clears throat> excuse me, the 2020, um, how 2020 unfolded and the challenges that we experienced. 
the resolution was the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I just want to take a sip of water. <clears throat> My apologies for that. The resolution was communicated to our members as required by the constitution. And at this stage, I just want to read the resolution that was shared with the members into the record. So the resolution reads that the constitution should be amended. And in terms of 5.1.12, that is titled discretionary powers, 5.1.12.1 reads, the executive shall have discretionary powers in the event of this major, an event beyond control, fortuitous or unavoidable, or comparable occurrences to maintain the integrity of the Altasa and sustain the mandate and execution of all associated matters. 5.1.12.2, the discretionary power shall be exercised on due consideration of all prevailing conditions by a court special meeting and ratified by majority vote by said meeting. 5.1.12.3, all discretionary decisions shall be communicated to members. And on that, at this stage, I need to ask the um, meeting whether there are any objections to this meeting, um, to this amendment, my apologies. And Kasuri, I want you to just monitor that, please. If there's no objections, then the resolution carries and is ratified by this meeting. And on that note, I hand over to Nomfundo who will report on recruitment and membership. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, at the beginning of this year, I have worked with Doris Mnengegueva on membership and recruitment. Um, and then in the last two months, joined the conference team. Um, um, what we we're doing with Doris in, in this portfolio. We had to keep track of membership and to advertise the organization as much as possible. Um, in 2019, we only had about 15 ad hoc members that had joined during the course of the year. But then a big change had happened when we sent out the call to encourage people to join. Um, for the Heltasa, for the Heltasa, and also for the conference at the same time. Then we saw members of about seventy-one that has registered um, for the conference, and then with three members from outside South African universities, that is University of Namibia, Ghana, and Eswatini, and. Um, then because um, the conference, the main conference is the main event where we get um, lots of membership. So um, when we look at the numbers, uh, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, because um, the conference, it's where we get lots of, our, of the new members. So, um, in 20, we'll start from 2017, where we have seen which were the conference, which was at DUT, we had about 322 members that had joined. And then in 2018, which was at Nelson Mandela, we had 395. And then in 2019, which was at Rhodes University, we had 305 members. And um, this year, we had about 300 that has registered. <clears throat> then, um, Thank you. Thank you, Nampondo. Um, I just want to take the moment, <clears throat> sorry, a moment to thank Doris, uh, who was on the membership and recruitment team 
We want to wish Doris well with her focus on her PhD studies going forward, but she'll always remember, uh, remain part of the Heltasa family, she says. Um, colleagues, I want to move to another important aspect of the Heltasa uh, sort of operations, and this is our uh, social media and communications uh, platform. Um, over the years, and part of the strategic objective was to build up this arm of Haltasa in terms of communication with members via newsletters, um, social media posts, and uh, using the website as um, a place where institutions, organizations in higher education could advertise, whether it was vacancies or events, etc. So our website has, play, has played that role. Um, over the years. So these are some stats in terms of how our social media presence has grown. Um, and I think the one thing we can, um, you know, um, claim in a sense is that we have put Heltasa on the map. Um, it has always been well known, but I think now um, well established and, and certainly an important voice in the national sector. Uh, you are part of that voice. And like all my colleagues have been saying, we encourage you to please uh, collaborate with us so we can make that voice stronger. Um, we have had the privilege of working with a social media company, Pomegranate. Uh, Liz Fletcher is the director of the company with a co-partner. And these members here uh, that you see on the screen are dedicated to Heltasa and have been able to very expertly um, in such um, collegial manner and with such energy uh, as only young people can do um, to give us ideas and to really be quick on the button in terms of making sure that Heltasa is seen, heard in different spaces. So I want to take the opportunity and the, the, the time now to thank Pomegranate. This is not just a business relationship. We have developed such great collegial relationships and it's been a pleasure working with them. Um, these are um, further stats from March to November this year. And you will look at the website visits, um, Facebook, etc. Uh, you're most welcome to visit the website. It's a work in progress, but you will find the constitution there. You will find information on past conferences um, and we'll be regularly updating that. Um, in the past, um, Heltas has not really been in a very good financial place. Um, so it wasn't able to do all of this. Um, so we need to be able to understand that the organization has grown through support um, from DHEAD through a UCDG grant, from membership fees, and, and this is how we are using the funds in order to build the organization in a stronger way. <clears throat> we now move over to special projects, and I would like to hand over to Dr. Mary Masahela, who will take us through um, the first project, which is very important to Heltasa. She's the interim chair of the National Teaching Awards which formerly was known as the National um, Teaching Excellence Awards. Uh, Mary, over to you. Thank, thank you, Kasturi, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, the Teaching Awards, last year uh, during the 2019 conference, it was announced that 2020 will not be a year for the awards, but it will be for ref reflection and restructuring. That happened through workshops that were held uh, by with the 2019 adjudication committee on the 4th and 5th of November, as well as the past awards chairs, past winners, representatives from DHEAD, CHE, USAF and the National Coordinating Committee representatives on the 6th of November. So all the ideas that were gathered through these workshops came to an agreement that uh, the, the, the awards will even change the name. We now call it National Teaching Awards, meaning that we are doing away with the concept excellence due to complexities 
that are attached to the uh, uh, concept. Then uh, again, also motivated by the, the aim or the purpose of the awards. The, the purpose is to build a cater of academics with a scholarly approach to, to, to teaching. I think Kastura has already said something around that earlier on. So we, <clears throat> we did that um, also with the decision that uh, they had feels it is important or it is time now to elevate the status of the national awards instead of confiding, confining them to, to the higher education sector, but then they want the, the whole public to know the, the, that uh, there's teaching, good teaching happening in higher education. Then uh, what do they, they are they have proposed and that what was agreed was that uh, DHEAD will take over the ownership through, through the chair, chair, chairpersonship of the NCC. And however, that uh, ownership will be co-owned with the uh, CHE, Heltasa, USAF, of course, and the, and the DHEAD as well. So Heltasa continues to play a very special role in the teaching awards by uh, providing that professional support to the to to to, to the committee that will, will will serve in the national teaching awards. So the processes will actually be outlined in full next year after the committee has uh, worked on the whole thing. However, there's a preliminary agreement to say the process will take about two years in cases where, where an applicant is not, feels they, uh, he or she needs to be uh, developed or to, to be supported or mentored in one way or the other, then they can be for the, for a period of two years, be under mentorship, and then they join the the competition at the end of that. So then, um, how do we then going to to have all this happen? A cater of experts from amongst ourselves. When I say ourselves, I'm referring to all of us attending this conference and other colleagues in the higher education sector who might be interested, they, they, they'll have to apply for such uh, uh, positions. It's not a full-time position in the head, but it's going to be a, a position where you, similar to what we are doing now, where you work, uh, you, you do this uh, uh, type of um, exercise on part-time basis or as part of your professional development activity. So there'll be an advert. We, we do not know as yet when the advert will be, but uh, the, the, the current interim uh, committee will sit at the beginning of the year to have all that planned properly. So in the workshops that I spoke about earlier on, four activities were identified to help us uh, uh, reach our goal as national teaching awards. Four, act four activities in this project were identified research, two, establishing processes and procedures for the awards, three, creating a framework for the teaching awards, four, marketing and communication. So you can tell that uh, a whole lot of um, excuse me, a whole lot of work will happen at the beginning of the year, particularly under two and three. One, which is research, is an ongoing exercise which uh, can even start now or, or later, but uh, marketing <coughs> communication as well, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. So I think I can stop here and hand over back to Kasturi to give you a brief on the Health Asa PhD program. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, we move on to our special project number two. And um, I'm very excited, inspired, and happy to share with you um, that at the beginning of this year, we launched the DHIT Haltasa PhD program. Um, it got off to a wobbly start 2019, beginning of 2020. But um, early in the year, we were able to establish um, an advisory committee made up of um, seasoned academics in the PhD supervision field from across the country. Um, and um, when DHIT approached us about taking this on, um, it was exciting for a number of reasons, uh, but most exciting because we were able to focus a PhD on academic development. Um, uh, this is the core sort of starting point of Paltasa, if you look at it in terms of its coming into being, although now it's opened up, you know, its spaces and doors to many academics in the disciplinary fields, and we're working together with, with uh, across those um, sort of boundaries. But the PhD topic, which all the candidates, the 10 candidates who have joined us, um, have to respond to the question, how could academic development theory and practice reimagine and recontextualize itself to respond to persistent inequality and social injustice in context facing challenges? So you can see that in the PhD topic, the reverberations of some of the keynotes and the themes that Haltasa is concerned with and indeed have been raised in this conference and many other conferences uh, to date. Um, when we started in January, um, we met and, and got together a group of um, academic advisors or supervisors, if you like, um, and it was only in about March or April that we were able to put into action some of the uh, visions that this advisory committee had brainstormed under the expert leadership of Professor Michael Samuels from UKZN, and we came up with a plan for the year. It was at that point that I invited Sandra Williams to join me in co-convening this program from the Health Tasa point of view. So I'm going to hand over to Sandra for a little bit to please share some of the operational and, and programmatic um, highlights. Thank you, Kasturi, and I agree with you. This is absolutely an exciting space to be in, so very different to um, what we usually do. And um, on that note, um, Kasturi, I don't know whether you're going to move on to the next slide or whether this is a slide that I need to speak to. But um, we kicked off, as Kasuri said, on the 29th of April, and we did that remotely. And we managed to um, have conduct three um, workshops after that opening. And the focus certainly is on um, reimagining and recontextualizing what a PhD should be. And if I look at the three um, workshops, then we've um, some of the themes were being and becoming a doctoral student, shifting positionalities, developing coherence in a research pro, um, proposal, the research, the research wheel. And then thirdly, um, we've our students have moved so far that on Monday, the 7th of December, our last workshop for the year will be student led and they will be in charge of the um, workshop. And in that workshop, it is the theme is developing coherence in a research proposal. Besides those three big workshops that we had, we also had a series of scholarly contributions from various ADs and um, from the AC and invited academics. And I will pick up on that just now, Sandra. Excuse me? I'll okay. pick up on that just now. No problem. Thank you. So okay. as far as the, the way forward is concerned, I'm going to hand you back to Kasturi. Thank you so much, Sandra. A special shout out to Mr. Ntobeko Mbuyisa, who is the administrative support on the Heltasa PhD program. Um, he works at UCT and he's done a sterling job 
of learning how this higher education PhD program works and bringing his project management skills to it. I want to make a point about the way Haltasa has worked with administrative staff that um, we want to collapse the silos between academics and administrative staffs. So when we come together on any of these programs, we work as colleagues in a room, inviting comments, insights, um, uh, you know, reflections from, from everyone. Um, so not the background workers, uh, they're actually frontline workers uh, and we want to acknowledge that in the way we work. So, um, there are some of our PhD students who are in the room right now. And this is basically how we've been working in the online space over the last few months. As Sandra has mentioned, we've had three major workshops and this is high input sessions from uh, various supervisors, but we've also had um, support sort of sessions, additional on the side, if you like. So that's the kind of model that we're working with in this program. Um, the main sessions are theoretical input, uh, very much about the PhD itself as a canon and its structure, but the additional uh, sessions are about picking up themes and using those um, as ways to reinforce the kinds of uh, discourses and engagements. So um, some of the seminars um, revolved around that, but the additional sessions, as you can see in one, two, three, and four, we looked at specific themes that could complement and, and deepen understandings of seminars one, two, and three. So we think it's an interesting model. We invite you also to think about whether you'd like to join us in terms of the increasing the supervision capacity, not of the students because we're in the process of assigning students, but becoming the think tank to think about how to do a PhD differently um, in Africa, for Africa, how can we make this thing work and not just roll out the, the, the sort of um, template of the PhD. We are interested that students who graduate with a PhD are critical thinkers, can go back into their, their spaces and really think deeply about how we can um, work with teaching and learning. With that, I want to move over now to the next set of special projects and I hand over to Rita. Um, yeah, thank you, Kasturi. As mentioned uh, previously with regards to, I had a role to play in the special projects. Uh, one of them being TAO fellowships, which is teaching advancement at universities. Uh, now this is a project that uh, involves academics or selected academics from all 26 uh, institutions uh, who come together to engage and strengthen their teaching practices within the university, but at the same time, they also get to work in a regional collaboration and look at teaching and learning from that point of view as well. Uh, TAO has restructured their program and as part of the restructuring, they have a board of which Haltasa is a representative. Um, I move on to the next special project, which is the PUAT project. Uh, it's the professionalization of undergraduate academic teaching, a European Union pr project. It's um, headed by uh, uh, the person that we have to head this project or lead this project is Professor Inchwe from CUT. And um, in terms of this project, the aim is actually to um, embed the sustainable development goals within the curricula for undergraduate uh, programs. Uh, we have three South African universities participating in the program. And while Haltasa has a dissemination role in terms of the research results, um, the exec did raise their concerns about the assumptions made by the European project leaders of this project, of the context. Um, and I move on to the next, um, which is an in-house project. It's a special interest group. You'll find the word SIG coming up here. Uh, and this special interest group is actually led by uh, Mrs. Eunice Champion of the Nelson, Ma Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. Unfortunately, she could not be with us today, 
But uh, Eunice has been a doing a wonderful job in getting together the community of uh, academic development directors, uh, more especially from the teaching and learning centers, uh, as well as the teaching and learning leaders within the different institutions together uh, to form a special interest group. We find that very often we've been talking as the academics and academic developers or educational developers and instructional designers um, in isolation again. The messages are not carried forward to the leadership. And we think that uh, a collective uh, of these leaders can uh, be this place where messages can move uh, backwards and forth. And um, they held their first successful Poisana, which is a conversation. And uh, obviously we look forward to Eunice leading many other events in, the, in 2021. Thank you. And we'll, uh, sorry, move thank over you, to you. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Thanks, Rita. Okay, the last section of our work here, and thank you for staying with us. Um, I want to talk a little bit to report about um, the affiliations and partnerships that Health House has developed in the national space. Be, the first one being a very important relationship for us, um, and that is with DHET. Now, Health House was involved in uh, the creation or the initial stages of the national framework document. This started in 2017, 2018, and we have uh, had close relationships with DHET in terms of input into the document, uh, commentary, et cetera, et cetera. It's also very pleasing to note and to hear when DHET recognizes Haltasa as a key player in the national framework and the implementation thereof. We have been invited to be part of the National Coordinating Committee um, that is um, overseeing the national framework work for 2021. I'm sure you're going to hear about it next year from your DVCs and directors if you haven't heard about it already. And there are six um, petals or domains, dimensions that DHET has identified for strengthening um, you know, the practices of academics as university teachers. Um, DHET has also been kind, I think, you know, and confident because it's not easy for DHET to award a grant to a non-university organization. So we take it that there is confidence in the strength of Haltasa. And um, I'm going to ask Rosaline to please report on this. Thank you, Kasturi. And as you indicated that the relationship that we had with uh, DHET has been a great one. Um, for colleagues to remember that this program, DHET had funded uh, Heltasa over a three year period. So 2020 was supposed to be the final year of reporting. However, as we all know, because of the COVID pandemic, we had to request uh, DHET that we, post we postpone and make 2021 our reporting year. And we really want to be great to indicate our gratitude to us, DHEAD, for this understanding. And also, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, this UCDG, the University Capacity Development Grant, is housed, is still housed in rows in the Chattel uh, uh, unit. So we just want to acknowledge them. That's where Nom Fundo is also administering uh, this fund from with our colleagues, Lynn and, 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 and uh, Joanne. So we just want to appreciate that. And colleagues, we will continue saving using this grant for the next year. And we hope that because this is helping us to en enable us to be sustainable over the coming years. And with your membership fees that you are paying, and as I indicated in the chat box, what we can do to increase the membership is to share the link of this conference with our colleagues in our different institutions. And the more we uh, register in the organization as academics and academic developers, the more this uh, organization will be stronger financially and we can be independent without relying on, on sponsorships. And having said that, we just want to acknowledge your participation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Beg Kasturi. Thank you, Rosalind. Um, 
Thank you, Rosaline. And Rosaline is overseeing our UCDP uh, grant and all financial reporting regarding it. I also want to acknowledge Rhodes University as, as a, and Churtle in particular as a place that has supported Heltasa, its administration and much of the work over many years. And so they are also in a supportive role in terms of signing off, doing some of the admin work that is required because um, this grant is housed in, um, at, at Rhodes University. So thank you uh, for that. Um, Right, um, Rita. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think in terms of the strategic partners, the ISAID organization plays an important role. Now, ISAID is the International Consortium for Educational Development. Um, Haltasa is a member of the council and uh, it's represented by the chair. Uh, the importance of this uh, collaboration, this global collaboration, is the strengthening of teaching, learning, as well as the research uh, and scholarly uh, initiatives across the globe, uh, as well as within Africa. It's surprising that, um, you know, like uh, is mentioned in the slide, we could open up collaborations with our African partners on a, on a, on a smooth and more um, you know, effective manner through these representations. What's really very important to remember is uh, uh, Kasturi, um, Kasturi Biari League will be taking over the president's role of ICED in 2021 towards the latter part of the year. And it surely says that uh, a global partner like this recognizing an African voice in the lead uh, speaks a lot to our context and speaks to opening up more um, partnerships that could be garnered through this representation uh, within our context. And so with that, we also urge you to get involved when there are more calls that come about uh, to collaboratively partner with uh, the Global North, Global South through these interactions. Thank you, Kastri. Thank you very much, Rita. So on a penultimate note, one very important partner every year um, in the Haltasa organization is the conference convener. Every year there is, um, uh, as you know, a different university hosts a conference and we invite the conference convener to become part of the executive for the year. This year, we've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Nswaki Malebo from CUT, and she leads a very able team, as you've seen throughout this conference, um, who have held us and, and carried us and supported the entire conference, but with such um, warmth and such hospitality. It is amazing that one can experience that even through these um, mechanized online kind of um, platforms. So it says a lot about human energy that embodies these spaces. And we need to do more of that in our teaching and learning spaces. So um, it's also very interesting in the last five years to look at how different conferences, different hosts have given their own signature to the conferences they have hosted. They've all been um, different in, in the way that they presented, um, how they've engaged people, the actual themes, the keynotes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is really the strength of Heltasa uh, that we come together with this kind of acknowledgement of, of, of our difference, but how, um, how enabling that is to be able to appreciate that. I want to thank the conference organizing team and the management at Central University of Technology and everyone involved in helping us and, and um, you know, enabling such a successful conference to have so many participants uh, at this time of the year in an online platform is a huge achievement. Thank you very, very much. In terms of the last slide now, we enter into a new phase of Haltasa's strategic planning. The next four years are going to be important in terms of the new goals, new objectives. So we enter into this creative generative space. We want to be relevant, responsive and resilient. We invite you to come together with us in any shape or form, send us an email. We've already had 
had a couple of people who said, I want to become part of this organization. Please, if you want to make the contact and let's make it happen. Onwards and upwards for Health Tasta. If there are any matters, any issues, any comments that you'd like to make, we have the last five minutes or so in which we can do that. If not, I will have to call the AGM to a close. Thank you all very much. And um, we look forward to convening and conferring again in 2021. We have some interesting ideas about the 2021 conference, but we will share these on the website and the newsletters that you will start receiving as members of Haltasa in January, 2021. I can't see the chat, but if someone can please tell me, or if you want to use your mic, please uh, bring your voice into the space. Are there any other matters that you think we need to take note of? And Kasturi, just a quick note from us. I am leaving the survey link in the comments. So if people can just please in the chats, access the, the survey and just answer the question if was, leave your thoughts with us, what you thought about the conference and everything. That really helps us for future organizations so that we know um, how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Is there anyone else yes. who would like? Yes, sure. Yeah, there was a question that where is the next health test are going to be held? Yeah, I've just uh, uh, responded to that. But just to say that we have new ideas about where the 21 conference will be held. And we're going to do a quick survey and we'll get back to you in January about some ideas on that. Okay, if there are no other comments, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the executive team of Haltasa who have worked so well in this year. I want to take, uh, thank all the old members, all the new members, the CUT conference theme, um, team, and um, I wish you well over the break and hope you have a good rest and I hope you feel energized enough um, to come back in January and, and keep working at what it is we do best. Thank you.